you already. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. All right, so uh, hello and welcome to South Africa virtual town hall meeting. Um, a space where we bring together African and African oriented thinkers and experts to deliberate on issues and share ideas uh, concerning African advancement in the 21st century. Um, today, we shall be discussing the topic epistemic racism and the need for decolonization in education. I am your host, Chogu Abdu, um, joining in from Nigeria. And I'm glad to have today as my co-host, Idara Isang. Idara, say hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. Yes, um, I am an expat of a southern part of Nigeria, I, but I've lived and schooled in California um, most of my life. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and social commentator, and I'm fairly new as a contributor to the uh, transdisciplinary Agora, and um, I'm very uh, interested in the conversation, uh, the talk conversation as, uh, as someone who has, has experienced uh, the educational system in the West, but being of African descent. Um, so I'm very keen to know the perspective of the distinguished panelists, which I've read a little bit about and very broad and insightful and diverse. So I'm very uh, pleased and um, I welcome everyone here and I look forward to your input. Right, thank you, Dara. <clears throat> and uh, it's my honor and pleasure uh, to have us joined today by uh, a panel of experts, uh, well distinguished in their various areas of endeavor, uh, who shall be helping us to tease apart the topic um, of our conversation today. Um, I shall be going through their respective profiles and after which we dive straight into the discussion. So joining us today first is uh, Dr. Azaya Negedu. Uh, Azaya Negedu is a member of the prestigious Conversational School of uh, Philosophy. Um, he lectures in the Department of Philosophy at the Federal University of Lafia in Nigeria. He is also a fellow, a research fellow at the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. His research subdisciplines cut across African philosophy with special interest in race philosophy and the African predicament, also social political philosophy and epistemology. Dr. Negedu is the author of The African Predicament in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Welcome, Dr. Negedu. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having, nice having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, next on our panel is um, Mr. Ernesto Yeboa. Mr. Ernesto Yeboa is the leader and is the founding leader of the Economic Fighters League, EFL, which is a pan Africanist and pan Nkrumahist movement. He is a radical activist and author of the Students' Manifesto, which he wrote while studying at the University of Ghana. Uh, towards his first degree in political science and history. In his final year at Legon, um, Leboa, Leboa waged uh, a year-long year struggle and a one-man protest against the flawed system while calling for free education at all levels in Ghana. Mr. Yeboa also was instrumental in the movement that led to the expansion of student accommodation, uh, which saw over 10,000 students gathered in February 28th crossroads. Uh, since he formed the EFL in 2016, the movement has been um, engaging and, and urging Ghana's youth in challenging the political status quo. Mr. Yeboa, pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, comrade. Okay, and then next we have Dr. Elin Zuberi. Dr. Elin Zuberi is uh, a thought leader a change agent, 
and the bridge builder uh, based in Hawaii, USA, and Arusha, Tanzania. Dr. Zuberi is a community advocate, a serial social entrepreneur, and is passionate about grassroots level nation building, social justice. Among her several current roles, she is currently the lead for community management office of the Wakanda Africa Value Ecosystem, also known as WAVE. She is also the chairperson uh, board of directors of the Afro Science Foundation, uh, which is uh, a foundation for the preservation of indigenous languages and cultures and uh, facilitates uh, facilitators of learning science in Africa using modern tongues. Uh, Dr. Zuberi, welcome on board. Dr. Zuberi? Yes, can you hear me? What a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's great All to right. be here. And then next we have Dr. Edward Hodgins. Edward Hodgins is, is Director of Advocacy and a Senior Scholar at the Atlas Society. He was formerly Director of Regulatory Studies for the Cato Institute and Editor of um, Regulations Magazine. Um, Dr. Hodgins served as a senior economist for the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress and was both deputy director for economic policy studies and director of the Center for International Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. Um, Dr. Hodgins has taught at universities in the United States and in Germany. He also served as Washington director and then executive of the Atlas Society before taking up his current um, positions. Dr. Hodgins is also currently the CEO of the Transitionary Agora for Future Discussions, TAFTS, which is bringing this uh, program to you today. Dr. Hodgins, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And by the way, my current uh, position is actually now the uh, founder of the Human Achievement Alliance, uh, which is very much focusing on the questions that we're going to be discussing today. Mm. All right, that would be great. Looking forward. Okay, and then finally on the panel, we have Frederick Chongui. Frederick Chongui. Chungi, Chungi. Okay. Chongui, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Frederick Chongui is a Cameroonian activist that is based in France. In 2013, he developed um, the association uh, known as Generation Unhib Uninhibited, which advocates the integration of youth politics and the fight against social inequalities. He is author of the book, Out of My Comfort Zone, uh, in which he traces his political and associative commitments throughout the world, as well as the difficulties that a young black man of African origin has to make in, uh, has to make in his way in French political life. As a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, he, alongside four other leaders, created in 2020 a non-profit organization called the Community of Global Leaders, which is an organization with the aim of providing global leaders a platform where they can collaborate to solve major issues by synergizing their individual efforts. Uh, Mr. Chongui, thanks for joining us. I just want to mention that I, I was appointed uh, the ten by the the Junior Chamber International as a ten uh, young leader of my country, Cameroon. Just to know. All right, great, great. Yeah. All right, uh, we will start with you, um, Doctor Negedu. Yeah. You there? Yes, I'm with you. All right, Doctor Negedu. Uh, today we will be discussing epistemic racism and the need for decolonization in education. But then we need to get some concepts straight. Uh, as a philosopher, can you uh, break down for us um, some conceptions of, uh, of epistemic racism or some intellectual arguments that we have out there about the notion of epistemic racism? All right. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, I can. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Um, 
uh, epistemic racism. Yeah, it's actually a, a concept I find appealing because it resonates uh, very much with, of course, the society I belong to, the conversational society of philosophy. Now, the whole discourse surrounding epistemic racism stems from, you know, setting the bits over the years, emanating uh, from the global south about uh, who has the right to knowledge and who also has the right to know. So who is a teacher and who is supposed to be a student, the recipient of knowledge? So uh, there is also the question of what should be known and how it should be known in terms of methods. So the uh, epistemic racism, you know, st stems from the fact that for so long, uh, scholars and uh, people generally from the global south uh, are, are felt uh, suffocated by uh, Western uh, systems of knowledge, which of course is presented to the world as uh, universalism. But in the actual sense, uh, from the global south, most of many of the scholars will want to agree that what is presented to us as universalism is actually particularism in these guys. So we now have a task to deconstruct, and this was what uh, triggered the rise of postmodernism, you know, especially in the global south. So I, I think uh, our, our discourse here will be centered around uh, creating. Uh, alternative knowledge systems have allowing others to have a breathing space. And of course, it's captured in one of your sub things, you know, border thinking, border thinking. So I think I'll leave it there for now. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nigeru. Um, for that insightful opening to our, our discourse here. Um, there is, um, there's an issue which prompted this, uh, this topic that we're discussing today. And that is um, an announcement that was put out by the Amsterdam Business School, where it's, it's stated that an African degree um, is equivalent to just um, two years of academic education in yes. the Netherlands. And as such, whoever is to apply for uh, a master's degree in the Netherlands will have to go through both the bachelor's degree and the master's yeah. degree uh, in, in every African country except South Africa and Ghana, before yeah. such a person will be considered eligible for, uh, for admission into the Netherlands. Yes. Now, um, do, is this part of the epistemic racism we're talking about? And um, so such different standards be upheld, uh, um, what could have been behind that notion of creating a different parameter for, for Africans. Okay. What do you think? Y yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to answer, I'm going to respond from two angles. Uh, well, from the, the first point I will state is that, yes, for me, I see it as epistemic racism because uh, you, you have not told us the yastic which you use to dismiss degrees from many African countries, you know, in preference for the West. While when we look at, you know, uh, the, the indicators for, you know, the best uh, colleges and, you know, the rating of colleges around the globe, we also note that there are some universities, even in the West, that rank lower than universe, some universities from Africa on the global scale. So if such uh, are giving preference over universities from many African countries, then it is questionable. That is one aspect. Now, there is another aspect which uh, 
I'm going to be very frank about because when this discussion was raised, I, I, some of us, we, we had some debates and we challenged ourselves. Now, some hard truths should be told to many universities in Africa, speaking particularly of the Nigerian experience. Um, I, I, I will put it bluntly, the way it is. In comparison to my experience, being in South Africa. Don't forget also that even in South Africa, you know, which is also within Africa, if you are leaving Nigeria to acquire a master's in South Africa, you first of all have to do what we call honors. Honors. So, and the reason is because the degree you come with from Nigeria is not totally acceptable in South Africa. So you first of all have to do a one year honor program before you proceed for their masters. So it's not just Netherlands, it's, it's, it's done also in South Africa. Now, we should note that one of the indicators, or for me, the most important indicators to determine the rise and fall of a university is research. And research, is also determined by uh, the quality or the reputability of the kind of journal stroke publishers a researcher or a scholar, a lecturer uses or publishes, you know, his or her results, a research results. Now, back here in Nigeria, you find a situation, I'll use my university as a, a perfect example. I'm with the Federal University, of Lafia in Nasara State, Nigeria. So, and we have a new vice chancellor who tells us yeah, that yes, I want to make uh, the Federal University of Lafia one of the best, uh, one of the first five universities in Africa in the next five years. And we meet ourselves, we tell ourselves, yeah, it's good to be optimistic, but you know, um, it's, it's not feasible, it's not possible for you to make the university one of the first five in Africa. Why? Because when, you, when, when university administration want to talk about their successes or their achievements, they talk about their achievements in terms of physical structure, not in terms of research of their scholars. And because research output is the highest indicator. Very few persons are interested in the physical structures you have put out. So, and it all boils down to, okay, uh, how many papers or how many scholars in your university, in your institutions have published in a year, for instance, in, in, in Scopus written journals and, and, and some other highly you know, research journals. Now, when you look at the university structures, for instance, in Nigeria, th there are very few persons who have publications in such outfits. Then you begin to question yourself, uh, uh, is, for instance, South Africa right or is Netherlands right in making that comparison? Where, for instance, in Ghana, I know for one that the University of Ghana, for instance, I was there some years ago, and some of the professors told us that in University of Ghana, for you to become a full professor, you must have one third of your publication in first quartile journals or publishers. That does not happen, for instance, in Nigeria. So if Netherlands is making reference to Ghana, and South Africa, I'm not surprised because I'm familiar with those two environments. I'm not surprised. So we cannot put it solely on racism. You have the other part uh, of the blame, which should also go to those countries. Right, thank you, doctor. And um, you mentioned South Africa, you mentioned Ghana. I have a question regarding uh, concerning South Africa to post to you, but that would be I'll have to come back to you on that. But right now, I'd like to move to uh, Mr. Yebua. I'd like to bring in Mr. Yebua also um, with respect to some, um, some comments that Dr. Negedu said about Ghana. Uh, Mr. Yebua, are you there? I'm here. All right. Um, I'm here. Now, there is um, this other issue that has been of concern to to several um, Africans of recent, uh, especially, I know here in Nigeria last year, after 
after the end SARS movement was crushed, um, there was this rise in interest among Nigerians in writing the IELTS exams. Because many Nigerian many, many Nigerian youths didn't see much of their future in this country. But then even IELTS uh, is proving to be another hurdle. That's talking about the international English language testing system. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the other one they call test of English as a foreign language, T TOEFL. Um, now, from Nigeria to South Africa, even South Africa demands TOEFL from Nigerians. But then outside Africa, it is the case that for many Nigerians, many um, Africans from English speaking countries who seek to further their studies in um, English speaking universities around the world are required to write IELTS or TOEFL. Now, the question that some people are asking is when most of these Africans speak English as their lingua franca, English is our lingua franca. Most of these Africans also undergo education using English as the language of instruction from pre tertiary up to tertiary levels. So, why should it be the case that an African from such a country where English is the language of instruction will still be required to write an English test when seeking admission uh, in a foreign university, in a foreign English speaking university? Um, is this is this something of a different parameter for Africans or is it still part of the uh, epistemic um, superiority that uh, those in the West display towards Africans? What do you think? Well, thank you very much, um, comrade, and um, greetings to all my um, fellow panelists. Um, racism, just many other um, situations that people find themselves in um, cannot be broadly explained and understood unless one feels it or faces it or experiences it. And so in many of these conversations, um, you may actually find out from the other side that they do not even understand that what um, they are implying by the imposition of such rules uh, is, uh, amounts to racism. And in this particular instance, epistemic racism. When we talk about epistemic racism, what comes to mind for me is the fact that um, it's the racism that is experienced in knowledge production. And um, I recall an instance where a friend of mine um, traveled to Canada to pursue further studies or to do her PhD. And um, in the conversation with her uh, supervisor, um, told her that regarding her and what she would conduct in, would want to um, source her data mainly from black scholars. Apparently, the white lecturer took offense. And I mean, unbeknown to her, a PhD program that was supposed to last for just three to four years ended up it's a sixth year. Sixth, sixth. Now, it was later, I mean, getting to the sixth year that she realized that, no, I mean, there's something fundamentally wrong here because it's not as if, as if not intelligent, as not as if I am not, I'm not uh, putting the relevant source to make it the relevant. And then it is simply because of that conversation that was hard, was hard with the, the, the supervisor. supervisor. And so black people go through many of the many of the I mean race or experience many of these races on a daily basis. But then on the African continent, continent, the 
racism, racism may, may, may be experienced, may be experienced. <laughs> and um, some may actually never experience racism in their lives, in their, lives so, so their time of their time. Uh, racism in South Africa, for instance, for instance cannot be equated be equated with Ghana. Ghana was the two the two domain or spaces spaces. Okay, is it is it is it okay now? Is it okay now? Let's see that echo on the background. Uh, okay. What could be the problem? Okay. Because um, uh, just go on. Well, I think the problem is, uh, Chick, if you have uh, another device that you are connected with, I think the speaker is close by. No, I'm, I'm actually, using two devices. Phone. Okay, it's make use of a headset or your earpiece. Your earpiece. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let me let me just let, let me get my let me get my. So you speak to somebody. Else. I'll I'll take over. I'll, when, I'll take over when I. Okay. Is that um, fine? Okay. Is that um, fine? Um, is that fine by all? Is that fine by all? If okay, yeah, just sort okay, sort it out and then sort out and then when you when you. Okay, so um, okay, so um, since my voice is also my echoing. voice is also echoing. Um, go ahead. Are we all echoing? Are we all echoing. We're all echoing. We're all echoing. It sounds like it. Sounds like it. No, I, I don't think no, so. I, I don't think so. You're echoing too. You're echoing too. Okay, Dr. Hodgins. Dr. Hodgins. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I believe um, my call is for my call for you. Question for you. Um, Idara, are you um, there? Idara, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, we all seem to be echoing. Yeah, we all I've got interesting, interesting comments, but I don't comments, necessarily want to hear them twice. Want to hear them twice. So, I'll see. Are we having a? See, are we having a? Maybe everybody. Maybe should everybody mute should mute themselves. Who is not talking? Now, if our host could make a comment. Did you hear me echoing? I seem to not be echoing. Uh, it's okay now. Um, I think okay. Okay. Uh, it's from a gadget, particular gadget I'm trying to trace. Okay. Go ahead. We seem to be okay. All right, so let's go ahead. Okay. Do you want to so I'm back. I'm back now. Is it oh. is it better? Yes. Do you still hear yeah, that echoing? Okay. So just um, can you just finish up what you were saying before we move on to Dr. Hodgins? Yes. So, like I was saying, I mean, epistemic epistemic racism most definitely um, reflects differently. Um, if applied or when applied to the various African countries. And um, I'm happy that um, the example, the particular example of um, the isolation of Ghana and um, South Africa has been mentioned um, in relation to Netherlands, I mean, um, education, even amongst um, Africans ourselves. I think, um, 
we 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 would often laugh at ourselves with uh, our tonations um, and most popular because I'm here in West Africa um, is um, the jokes that is shared between Nigerians and Ghanaians where Nigerians feel this they they have a better tonation at the English language than uh, Ghanaians and Ghanaians also feel they have a better uh, tonation at the English language um, than, than, than Nigerians. But then the bigger question here is um, the language in which um, the conversation takes place itself um, underscores the, 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 the racism that, 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 that is being discussed. Uh, I'm sure um, Frederick um, understands perhaps the English language um, differently from, from, from the way we may understand uh, the language with respect to specific words and all of that. And yet we are supposed to um, sit in the same class, classroom or, or, or enter the same field and do our research in his language. Um, uh, hoping that we would, there would be some parity, I mean, along the way. But it's, 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 it's also the matter of necessity, the necessity to be able to have a common language, to be able to uh, have common criteria, common convergences, and all of that. So um, there's some unintentional aspects that one cannot also lose sight of when discussing epistemic racism. And that's um, the point I seek to, to highlight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yeboa, for those very insightful comments. Um, Idara, can you, um, I believe you want to say something or ask the question of Dr. Hodgins? I uh, actually had a question for the person that just spoke regarding the expectation to uh, learn um, or, or to, to study in English in, in Ghana. Who was that? Was that? Yes. My question yeah. is that recently um, Harvard University is, is, is um, developing a course um, based on the Igbo apprenticeship system, which is developed by the Igbo tribe in Nigeria. And, and I mean, I think, don't you think it's more the initiative of the particular country to teach in the language on, on their level, but that it's actually a benefit to be able to uh, use English because as you said, it's a matter of necessity because you wouldn't expect that, you know, an American university because it's learning something that's developed by you know, a foreign country would have to learn that body of knowledge in that particular language. So you see that, um, I mean, I don't understand what is the, um, the exact um, way that learning in English is uh, somehow um, disadvantageous. Well, um, is that um, Indira that spoke? Yes, yeah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think it's, um, it, it runs both ways. And um, there isn't a particular answer to, 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 to this. Because um, let me tell you what, what is happening here in Ghana. Um, okay. We, in terms of our education system, for instance, have um, not been able to decolonize yet. So much of what you find in our education curricula um, is what was designed and handed over to us by um, classic British um, um, uh, col col colonialists. I mean, if, if one has to put it that way. And um, I'm sure if you would even Google, you would find that uh, it's not just with the curricula, it's also with the rules and regulations that apply um, uh, on our various campuses in the schools and, and, and all of that, where students are expected to speak the English language or else 
they will be punished. Where um, our languages are described as vernacular. Um, very, yes, very, very derogatory. I mean, if one has to put it, but it, it comes from a certain perspective, the perspective of um, the colonialist thinking that your languages are languages of the savages and therefore um, in order to complete the civilizing mission, uh, you should be able to speak like me, write like me and act like me, just like what um, happened I mean, in, 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 in France with um, the policy of assimilation and all of that. So on our part, I, I think that it's, it's a two-way um, thing. Uh, on the part of Black people, Africans, we, 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 we need to make that effort. And then on the part of um, uh, Western brothers and sisters, they also need to be conscious of, 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 of the existence of that um, blight or that um, form of racism which may be passed on without um, with, with, without they necessarily because, meaning to, to inflict right. that I mean on, 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 on black people. So I think that it's, it's a two-way approach if you ask. I see. Okay, I understand your perspective in that sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. All okay. right. Um, I, before we lose uh, track of, 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 some, of some thought, I, I would like to pose a question about language to Dr. Zuberi. But well, please just hang on, Dr. Zuberi. I'll, I'll get it to you in a moment. But uh, I would like also for Dr. Hodgins, Hodgins to respond to this question of the IELTS exam, the International English Language Testing System exam that is required of Africans who do their education in the English language, uh, them still being required to write English, uh, pass an English test before they'll be considered for admission in the West. Uh, Dr. Hodgins, is there a rationale for this? Or uh, can we see this as a, a just system of education with regards well, to the relationship between Africans well, and the West? Yeah, well, that's a big question. By the way, in this country, interestingly enough, that conversation comes up concerning people from South Asia, from India, Pakistan, and places like that, because people in those countries are very much involved now in the American economy and American education and so forth. And so there's always a complaint that you hear, well, this person from India talks with such an accent that I can't understand them. So interestingly enough, it's not just about Africans, it's about uh, when, when, when people from other countries are dealing with someone whose language is English, so, and I so, suspect so is it is it because of African the accent of Africans that we have to go through that test? Is it a matter well, of? Well, I'll accent? tell you what. My belief is this. Um, I don't know as much about those tests, but I think you have an institutional issue here that I want to put it into a broader uh, context um, uh, about the institutions. First of all, we have legal racism, okay, and that is something I think everybody can identify as evil. In the United States, in this country, we had legal segregation for many, many, many years. And fortunately, starting in the 1960s, uh, we, the, the, we knocked down those laws. In South Africa, it was even worse, of course. It wasn't just legal racism in, uh, you know, in some areas. It was legal racism everywhere. And it was, a, it was a far worse system than the United States. And of course, that was knocked down uh, uh, several decades ago. But the problems still persist. In Nigeria, um, when you speak about Nigeria, Nigeria is almost like saying Europe, because remember, Europe gave us what I consider to be a great thing, the Enlightenment, and it also gave us lots and lots of wars between French, German, Italian, and whatever. In Nigeria, there are different languages, uh, there are different cultures, there are different tribes. And so I know that in, and, 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 I, and, and plus between other African countries. So you can say, is that racism or is it tribalism? Is it one culture and language versus another culture and language? So I don't limit it just to race. I look at it in a broader sense. But here's the, I think the answer, the context of the answer to your question about language. And that is, you have to distinguish between 
what I would consider racism, either legal racism or the, the, the horrible version of racism where some people just might believe that, well, blacks are inferior or Indians are inferior or whatever, or Asians or whatever, and institutional problems. The education system, even in the West, and I can tell you about the United States, has very serious deep problems um, in this country. For example, um, what used to be a degree that we would get in our high schools is probably something that you have to get in college today because the standards have been so reduced in this country, in the United States over the last 30 or 40 years. We have a system in this country because we were talking about universities of what's called publish or perish. That is, if you wanna become a professor, you have to publish an article. But there's been studies that show that most of those articles are worthless. Uh, nobody reads them. Uh, they're simply a way of certifying, see, I'm an expert. Whereas they contribute very little to uh, an area of knowledge. Um, and so I think, I think you have a lot of problems within the system itself. And I'll give you two, I'll give you an important example. In the United States now, and I suspect that uh, our friends can talk about some of the other parts of the world, major technology companies do not require four-year college degrees. Uh, companies like Apple and Google and so forth say, if you can show, if you can show that you uh, can do the work, if you have some form of certification that's not necessarily a university education, that's fine. We just care that you can do uh, the work. And in fact, in this country, tech, the tech industry has a very high proportion of folks from South Asia compared to uh, you know, their, their percentage in the population. Now, also in this country, in the United States, we have a larger proportion of Africans in the medical fields. Um, my, my, my father was unfortunately in the hospital more than he was out of the hospital much of last year. He's 89 years old. His best doctor was from Nigeria. And I talked to him about, well, why are you here helping my dear father? Why, the, why are you not in Nigeria? And it was because of the social system, the terrible economy and the corruption. The women mostly who came in and helped my mother while my father was in the hospital because my mother has uh, Alzheimer's were from Africa and they did a very good job. And so, um, and they didn't, I don't know that they had college degrees, but the point is they were coming up through the American uh, uh, system. And I could give you other examples of where different minority groups will get into one industry or another. And uh, in where I live right now, we have a large Chinese community, an Asian community, I could tell you about them. So a lot of the issues we're talking about, I think aren't imagined about race, but they're about some other um, I want to add one more, uh, 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 and so whether these, and, and so it might well be that some of these tests are simply, well, we've always done it this way, and we want to protect our jobs, and we want to be able to justify our, you know, money if it's coming wherever it's coming from, and so this is the way we do it, and that's not necessarily a good market way, because as I say, Apple Computer doesn't care, the Apple computer cares that you can do the work and you can communicate with your colleagues. That's what they care about. I'll make one other statement before I let my, uh, uh, my fellow panelists comment. Um, I'm a universalist. I believe that human nature is universal, whether you're Chinese, African, Caucasian, whatever, we all have a similar nature. Uh, we're all, uh, we all have a rational capacity and we are endowed to quote the founders of this country with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe in the universality of human nature. We are having a discussion right now. We are scattered all over the world, but there's a truth about science that it, somehow we've got a technology that works. If somebody is operating on my father or one of your relatives or you, there's a universality about whether the medicine works or not. There is universal truth. It's always in context. And there are always things that we're discovering. We're not omniscient. But I want to stand up very strongly against the postmodernism and in favor of a universality of human nature uh, and a universality of truth. And it's not, and, and the, yes, 
is it an have we had have we had a lot of stumbles along the way? Absolutely, we have, but that doesn't mean we abandon the notion that there's a universal system uh, or universal nature for all human beings, and that we know from the United States because my mother's family were poverty-stricken Italian peasants who came here and didn't speak the language, and I was able to work my way up. I scrubbed toilets, I did things like that, and I worked my way up and I can go over all my other family members. That's the nice thing about the United States and about a system where as imperfect as it is, we've been able to create something that's quite incredible. I wanna see exactly that sort of opportunity spreading in Africa. I wanna see that respect for every individual, whether they're black, white, Chinese, it doesn't matter to me. So that's my vision, it's a universal, it's a universal vision. Uh, that I hope everybody can eventually share. All right, thank you, Dr. Hodgins. And um, I'm glad you mentioned universality, which um, from some from my own studies, uh, one could also find as um, one of the basic principles of the Enlightenment era. Um, I'll be coming back to this notion of, of the Enlightenment, especially as it relates to race. Um, because I have some questions to pose to you and Dr. Negedu um, with regards to the enlightenment and um, the concept of, of race. And if actually the enlightenment actually uh, really pro promoted universality and liberty, or uh, if we could find uh, some, 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 some roots of racism uh, back then in the enlightenment era. But at this point, I would like to bring in Dr. Zuberi, Dr. Elin Zuberi, um, you there? Hi, can you hear me? Oh, thanks for being patient all this while. Um, You're welcome. I'm bringing you here um, with respect to what uh, Mr. Yeboa said earlier about um, Africans studying in African schools uh, where they are required to, uh, to speak the English language um, to act and, and think like the, uh, like the English person and where indigenous languages are being um, demeaned as vernacular. Um, you, you work with the, the Afro Science Foundation, in fact, you're the chairperson of, of the board there. And um, part of what you do is um, the promotion or the preservation of, uh, of indigenous languages as well as cultures. Uh, now, my question to you is, how significant is this, the work you do at Afro Science Foundation, the work of preserving indigenous language and, languages and cultures? How significant is this or how significant could it be um, in, the, in the battle to resist the epistemic uh, inferiorization of Africans? Is it necessary um, for <coughs> For, for languages to be preserved if we must um, resist subordination in, in epistemic terms. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, can hear you. Hear? Yes, okay. I can hear you. you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, before I can, I, I go on to explain that I, um, I think there's some background that's missing about me that you need to know um, so that you can understand where I come from better. I um, actually was born and raised in a British colony. Um, I remember when I was three, third grade, I was confused. I wasn't sure who I was. I wasn't sure whether I was Hong Kongese or Chinese or British. If I'm British, which held a British passport, we're second class citizen, we're not allowed to live in Britain. I we didn't study our own history. I didn't know that Hong Kong was ceded to Britain because we lost the Opium War, because the British wanted to pay their tea and their silk with opium, which was illegal at a time under Queen Victoria um, instead of silver. And then we lost the war, so the Hong Kong was ceded. And I remember not being punished for speaking my language. Um, I had to speak English. We were taught um, the Helen of Troy. We were taught um, the assembly line. Uh, it was very confusing. Like 
And then so I actually was on the other side when I was growing up. I believed white culture was better. How did I become that? When I go to the post office, I saw the Queen Elizabeth III, her picture on the wall. We celebrate Prince Charles and you know Princess Diane's wedding. Uh, at night, at the end of the day, when the TV is shut off, there was national anthem of Britain. I ended up marrying a white person for 20 years. And I try and I try and I try and try to wonder what is going on? Why is that something doesn't drive? It's like, I can't talk to that person. What is going on? And I'm so confused. And after 20 years, I realized that even after my teen years, I was able to get out of the bubble. I call that a bubble because it was a total 100% social engineering. I was still confused until finally I got a divorce because I, believe, I, I finally realized that I, I could not, I just cannot. Um, it was culturally incompatible. Okay, now um, when we become who we are with our thoughts, our thought that to our action and our reaction and our plan and our, the way we see our future, if all this was um, expressed in a different language, then you will have things that you learn from, you, you inherit from your culture that you cannot express. You cannot express it in your thought. You cannot express it in your word. You cannot communicate that. Then you are a product of foreign culture. That is why it is so essential that I, I'm not opposing that you learn another language. That is not what I'm saying. Univers universality is, for me, is real, OK? I want justice served to Africa. And, but you need to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, if you, you can't speak your own language, you can't communicate your own culture, then you're, you're not who you are. You're, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about self-realization. I, I had just had this conversation with the founder of, um, of this organization and um, TAFFD. It is about self-realization. What is self-realization? There are two aspects of it. Number one is you know who you are. Number two is you become who you're supposed to be, your potential, your best potential. But to know who you are, you've got to understand your language. This is not the first time I come to a different culture and I said, you know, I try to immerse myself in it. The first one is, it was between Chinese and British. The second one was Hawaiian and American. And this one is African. I, I'm, now I'm married to a Tanzanian. So I'm a Chaga Tanzanian by marriage. So why is it important? I, I think I answered that question. There, there was so much more I want to say, but um, I, I think that uh, I hope you I answer part of your question. Is that is that good enough? <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zuberi. Uh, I'll get back to you on the, the question of um, the, the learning of science in mother tongue um, and why or how this could be uh, cognitively unique. Uh, but right now, I okay. we still have one final panelist who hasn't said anything yet, and that's Mr. Chongui. Um, Chong, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, thanks for patiently um, waiting all this while. Um, you okay. are um, an African intellectual in France. Um, I'm concerned to know the experiences you have as an African intellectual in France. Um, do you have cases of epistemic bias or uh, educational? Uh, forms of discrimination that you and maybe other Africans you know here in France uh, have gone through and would you like to share them with us? Uh, so uh, I will uh, use what uh, Dr. Eugen said. He said that in US uh, you have the possibility to create your own and to reach to uh, 
very very great position if you are if you want to if you, and if you work for in France is a bit different. Uh, I will take you an example, a concrete example example. When I get to my first year of bachelor, I think my promotion, uh, so the people I was I went to class with, we were almost 30 percent from Africa. When I reached to my second year, we were 20 percent. When I reached my third year, we were 10 percent. When I get to my master's degree, we were less than five percent. And then when, when, when I reached to the, my master, my second master's, we were only two percent. I think that means, I think this problem is caused by two things. The first one I think is finance, because uh, when, you, when, you go to, when you go to school, you need to have, you need to have money to, to, to buy your, 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 your studies. And the second one is the system. Uh, in France, it's very, very difficult uh, to reach for black, for black men or for African descent to come to, to reach to great position uh, because the system uh, blocks people and it's very, very difficult to see them, to see black persons succeed. Things are changing, but are, they are changing very, very slowly. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about my own experience because I think it's better. Uh, and we, you will more understand uh, what a black man goes through when he comes, when he travel. Because I did, I forget to say that, but I, I, will, I was born and raised in Cameroon, and I just came for France to do my uh, to to go to college. I'm currently doing a PhD in political science. I forget to say that. So when I first came here, uh, my first year, I was insulted by uh, a French by a French person. That say go back to your country. When you when you are in Africa, you don't you never have this kind of word because we are all like you are in your country. And then when you come here, you have such a word that's changed me a lot because that's start my activism. This and so start my activism. Uh, first of all, what I do is I join. I don't know if uh, someone of you knows that association is called SOS Racist. It's well known all over the world. Uh, and then I first joined them, but I, when I when I get there, I saw that it was not the black person that was in charge of the direction. Because when you have a problem, when you want to deal with a problem, I think you 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 can you you need to understand that problem. And if you are if the if the case is racism, if you are not if you are diff, like you are in your country, and uh, how can I say that if you are. I, I will go with the word. If you are a white person and you, you're dealing with racism and you live in France, it's not the same. You will not understand what a black person is going through. That's, that's a fact. So I, 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 I decide to create my own organization that you present. Uh, it's called in France, Jeune Génération des Complexes. It means that uh, we, you are black, but you can succeed. You can succeed if you give, if you, give you the, 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 the possibility to succeed. If you work hard, you can succeed. If we create a strong community, you will, uh, you will help, you will help your, each other. We will help each other to succeed. So I think things are changing because, you know, cosmopolitan, cosmo, uh, you know, everybody is traveling all over the world. Things are changing, but they are changing very, very slowly in this part of the world. We, we still have difficulties to, uh, to, to have a great position. Uh, when I'm doing my PhD, I'm, I think we are only in, in my, my, my school, we are maybe uh, 1%. So things are difficult, but things are changing slowly. So uh, for this, so this is my, um, my sharing with you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we have to, uh, to, to, to come together to change things uh, as, uh, and I think has uh, the previous, the, 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 uh, the, the Dr. Zuberi uh, said something important. It's very, very important to know who you are, who you are and where you come from. And this will help you to achieve more things, more great things. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chong, before. Um, those very wonderful comments. I, I would like to take this discussion to 
uh, a different trajectory now and uh, still building from where we're coming from though. And uh, in this case, uh, I would like us to really look at this thing called institutional racism, um, especially as some people uh, suggest still pervades um, campuses here in Africa and across the world. Um, institutional racism um, here in Africa may be seen as existing in campuses where we still have some vestiges of white settler colonialism, where perhaps um, there are still traces of white supremacy or white privilege uh, in vestiges in South Africa, for example. Um, so at this point, Perhaps I'll come back to you, Mr. Chongu, but let me pose this question instead to Dr. Negedu. Dr. Negedu? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah, you were in South Africa, you studied in South Africa. And um, um, there's this event that happened from, event that happened from years ago, years ago uh, called Roads Must Fall, uh, which was the, uh, which was which was the top statue top of Sister Rhodes, the imperialist at the University yeah. of Cape Town. Of Cape Town. Uh, what, what do you think is what the symbolism, is of, that symbolism of that kind of event? event? Um, is it an exaggeration, it an exaggeration or there's actually, there's some actually something that is against there? Against there. And, um, exactly. um, because after that, because after that it was all incidents, all incidents um, the movement spread across the universities in Africa. Um, is it really the case that um, it is racism that is hindering African students from reaching the peak of their potential, or it is it is something else, um, something lazy or something underachieving on our part? Should our focus be on bringing down monuments from a colonial past, or there's something else systemic about our educational system? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I had a, an opportunity to interact with uh, some of the students and some South Africans, you know, to get their, their view about the Roads Must Fall movement. And yeah, rightly, as you said, you know, the movement has spread to other parts of South Africa. In January 2020, for instance, last year, you know, when we had uh, the decolonial summer school organized by the University of Pazulu Natal, of course, you had people coming from every part of the world. And the, the, the students of the university, you know, uh, had a drama, you know, by, you know, a waterfall in front of, you know, the, the, what, what we call the, the, the Memorial Tower building. Now, there is the statue of one of the person in also the likes of Cecil Rhodes and this, the, the students are agitating, you know, till date that the, the, the statue will be pulled down, coupled with the fact that, you know, streets, there are streets around uh, the town in, in Durban named after uh, some of these, uh, uh, apartheid, uh, I, I mean, so, so, so some of these, um, how will I put it now, uh, beneficiaries of uh, apartheid. And, you know, some of those streets have been changed at the moment. The, the names of the streets have been, have been changed at the moment. Yeah, I, I will say that there is, there may, there may be political reasons or yeah, political undertone to all these movements. Yes, rightly said. But uh, we, we cannot deny the fact that uh, you, you cannot... Now, th these are people, for instance, who are said to have oppressed the masses. And you have statues in their honor you know, to in order to keep their in order to keep their name going. However, there is a double standard for me, which I think is being employed in all this movement. And here's the double standard. When we say roads must fall, when we say roads must fall, and we go over like uh, when, when when you go through the the history of the roads must fall movement, you will discover that. 
the person who started the movement of the roads must fall is actually a road scholar in UK. So is actually a road scholar in UK. So you are saying roads must fall, but at the same time you were giving you were giving grants in the name of the same Cecil Roads, and you collected the grants and went on studies. At that point, you know your your roads must fall movement was silent. So there is a double standard there. So let it be holistic. If you are saying roads must fall because you want the statue to fall, also you 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 we we should not be you know acknowledging you as a road scholar bearing the same name. So I it's. I I'm, I'm not at home with that standard, but I also think that they have, you know, a credible course to pursue in that regard in order to ensure that, you know, people not just among the, not just among, you know, the, uh, among, among the whites, but also among the blacks who have actually, you know, uh, ensured that they destroy the people uh, to see that those people in question, you know, who have helped to project, you know, the apartheid movement, their statue should be brought down. Now, in, in the same Durban, in the same Durban in South Africa, you, there, you have, there is a secondary school. There is a secondary school built by a European built by a European. And of course, for instance, when he built the school, the apartheid government, the apartheid government never wanted blacks, black South Africans to study in the, in, in the school. Now he did something so remarkable. When the apartheid government prevailed on him to prevent the blacks from studying there, he refused, he refused. So he insisted that he cannot, as a human being, created in the same image, just like the other blacks, prevent them from going to school. And what happened because of that, many of the whites, or most of them, removed their children from such schools because they could not imagine themselves being in the same school with blacks. Now, don't forget that the person who carried out this revolution was a white man. It wasn't a black man. But most times you will not hear such side of the story. <laughs> where a black man, where a white man made such efforts, you know, in, in order to bring down racism. I mean, uh, ap the apartheid regime. And don't forget also that during the apartheid regime, of course, we have credible information, you know, in, in research that states that during the apartheid regime, for instance, there are, the, we, we, we have instances of some whites, even among white women, you know, who were sent on exile because they were standing for the cause of the blacks. So when, when we want to tell the story, I think we should have a balanced narrative. Thanks for that very um, rational and um, balanced um, discussion into history and to history, um, teasing apart some of the, the some nuances, of the nuances um, between uh, those, who, those who, who think it's all, um, it's all about the white against black racism. Um, as, as, as the, the reason for the black on the achievement in education. Uh, I would like to um, bring in Dr. Hodgins. Uh, Dr. Hodgins, you, you seem to have a different view about this notion of bringing down monuments and, and statues in, 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 in universities and universities and education um, um, in, in the wake of, of the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter last year, last year, last year just floor, just floor. there were several universities, were several universities uh, across the West, uh, across the West, consider the idea of the name of their halls, their halls, um, to, uh, to ask, cleanse off ask, and and racist, off and racist um, heritage, heritage uh, within the university spaces. But then I read the work of yours where perhaps you, you see this as either tokenism or council culture, or there's a different argument you, you're trying to make uh, concerning this whole idea of bringing down statues. And perhaps you, 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 you seem to be saying that there should be other ways that people of color, blacks and people of color should pursue educational achievements rather than 
uh, these empty gestures of uh, just bringing down monuments. Can you um, explain to us better, elaborate better for us what you mean by that line of argument? Most certainly. Uh, now, I'm not here to defend Cecil Rhodes, by the way, so <laughs> please, uh, please understand that, um, uh, or, to, or to defend actual bigots. But a couple of, of things, and, and, and again, I realize that South Africa's experience is very different from the United States, even though we had our own you know, form of uh, apartheid, you might say, uh, here in the past. Um, but my, my concern, I have several concerns. First of all, um, symbolism over substance. For example, in the city of Baltimore that I mentioned, and I could mention other cities in the United States, in Baltimore, a year or two ago, there were uh, 13 high schools that had zero students competent in math. Zero, not only 40%, not only 30%, zero. And by the way, the 70, about 78% of the students in Baltimore City are black and then the rest, most of the rest are Hispanic, okay? And I could go down the horror stories of just how bad the schools are in Baltimore City. And it's been like that for decades. And I can talk about other cities in the United States as well where the education system has uh, completely failed. And it's not because they don't have enough money, they have about the same amount of money per student as we have in some of the other counties. I note that it's a crime-ridden city now. It used to not be like that. I note in, Bal in, in the city of Chicago, uh, last year, 769 people were murdered. Most of them were Blacks by other Blacks. I look at these systemic problems and what's frustrating is I'm a little bit older perhaps than some of you on this call. And so I've been watching these problems over many, many decades and say, well, when are we gonna actually address the real uh, fundamental issues. And so part of my frustration is to say, let's just tear down this statue or that statue. Well, why not actually work on getting to the systemic problems and building up? There's also, by the way, a question of how you choose what to tear down. For example, uh, in, during an American's founding, uh, there were thousands of slave owners. Um, however, uh, there was one slave owner, Thomas Jefferson, who had a vision of uh, a, un a more universalist vision and basically set the uh, standard for this country. Unfortunately, he did not live up to that standard. He did something unique that all the other slave owners didn't do. And I think that Jefferson and basically the enlightenment view of universe, certain groups that simply are way, always, we have to always treat them like children. We always have to give them special benefits and so forth because the assumption, and this is never stated, but the assumption is that somehow they'll never be able to live up to a universal standard. And I completely reject that. Partly, it's just because I'm not only uh, a, a philosophical universalist, but I'm an empiricist. I look at this country and I see people who are black, who I know personally and I've worked with for many years, who came from poor backgrounds and they're doing just as well as I am. In fact, they're doing better. One of them actually was elected president of the United States. I didn't agree with a lot of his policies, but you know, he worked his way up, okay? Um, and I could go down the different groups, Asian groups, uh, you know, and, and people I've worked with. So I see in this country empirically that people, if they're given the opportunity, can work their way up. And so I say, instead of focusing on symbolism, uh, why not focus on the actual roots of the uh, uh, problem? Don't lower standards. Um, basically raise the people or give opportunities for the people who uh, have been left out to raise themselves. And again, I understand that in, uh, in, in certainly in South Africa, because of the very different experience, there is a, a need to push back against the explicit racism that unfortunately is, is still there in the minds of many. And the examples you were just hearing uh, are exactly that. Ultimately, I want a colorblind society. Martin Luther King uh, famously said in his I Have a Dream speech, you know, that he had a dream that one day his four children will be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Uh, we heard, we, you know, we heard the discussion from, uh, from Eileen about who you are and being true to yourself. And this is something every individual has to work out for themselves. 
Um, we all come from a certain culture. We all have our own particularities. You know, part of my family are Italian. So I, I didn't learn as much Italian as I would have liked to because my relatives who came over here were trying to learn English. So I know some Italian, but not as much as I might, might want. But I'm comfortable in, certain, in a certain kind of culture. And each of you is probably comfortable in a slightly different kind of culture. But to me, that's one of the great things about the human race. We each, uh, you know, we each can have our particularities. But the, the, the thing I'd come down to is that what I think is most important morally is what kind of moral character do we build as individuals? What do we make of ourselves? That's our unique thing is that we can make our own moral character. Uh, what are our achievements? I like to say in my website, I say whether we're all achievers, whether we're, um, uh, whether we're nurturing a business to profitability uh, or a child to maturity, whether we're writing a song or a poem or a business plan or a dissertation, or whether we're laying the bricks to the building or designing the building or raging for its finances, our achievements are reflections of ourselves. And this doesn't have to do with accidents of birth. You know, what you achieve doesn't have to do with whether you're black or white or whether you were born in Asia or China or wherever it is. So when I talk about universality, I don't wanna look at you as a black man or a Chinese woman or a whatever it is. I wanna look at you as, look at this person, they're a wonderful person. Look what they've achieved. They've raised great children. They've helped their community. Maybe they've invented incredible technology that allows us to have this global conversation. That's the standard that I want to see out there. And I understand that each country has its own challenges, especially Nigeria. Um, but I want to hold up the standard as a universality standard that I hope the color of my skin is not the major way I'm being judged. I hope it's by other stuff. I might be wrong about stuff. I'm usually wrong about certain things, but hey, you know, that's why we're having conversations like this, right? Okay, good. Uh, Idara, I, I, I presume you have um, a follow-up. Yeah, Edward, I quite agree ahead. with your perspective that achievement is the ideal point of, um, you know, you know, in, you know um, point of uh, view in terms of, you know, how, how societies um, interact and so on. That being the case, though, and in light of the current situation and interest in eradicating racism in the sense of, it, of um, opportunities having been denied uh, to certain people, do you think that um, affirmative action should return to uh, American universities? Um, the same question I would pose to you also, Eileen, uh, what are your perspectives on, on that? Um, Affirmative action. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll start very briefly. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, uh, initially, in the 1960s, when you literally had legally segregated schools in this country, then there was a need to basically say, "I'm sorry, but the people who got half as much money uh, for you know education should be given more to bring them up." But we've been doing that for 50 years, and to me, the problems are more cultural. Uh, they're more this bigotry of low or the bigotry of low expectations. And I think that, uh, and in fact, I can, I can even give you more examples of how uh, the way um, some of these programs were instituted basically made matters worse. And again, I can point to almost any American uh, uh, city. I think that you have to uh, take a look at the deeper problems, especially low, the, the, what, I, you know, what we call the soft uh, bigotry of low expectations. And, and the other thing is this, by the way, uh, sadly, I'll, I'll, you know, when you take a look at Black Lives Matter in this country, something like seven or 8,000 Blacks are murdered each year in the United States. I just mentioned that last year, 769 people were murdered in Chicago. Most of them were Blacks. Uh, I was, by the way, in my small town where I used to live, uh, I was an elected commissioner. Uh, and this town was mostly black and, his, and Hispanic. So I was a minority in my own town. And I served as police commissioner at one point in my little town here in Maryland. And we had to fire two police officers uh, because one of them uh, was black and had, we, we, we didn't know when we hired him, he had actually beaten up his girlfriend. And so we didn't want someone carrying a gun in the town who had been beating people up. And one was white because he was just an irresponsible idiot. And we thought they were both threats to the town. So. 
I'm very cognizant of the need in this country, for example, to make sure that the police are responsible. On the other hand, what about the 8,000 Blacks who were killed last year? And so when I see the Black Lives Matter movement in this country, I see it's directing um, attention away from the actual real problems. And I believe, by the way, and I'll tell you right off, I think the answer in this country to education is parental choice. That is, we have an entrepreneurial system in this country that has produced the technology that's allowing us to have this conversation. And uh, I, you know, we have a book here that the that we that we put out. I hope that many of you have seen it already. That uh, OC was uh, behind this uh, wonderful book. Um, but what I see is I want to unleash in the education area the same kind of entrepreneurship in teaching kids that we have seen in the technology uh, area. Because look, we have an education system in the West that is um, a 19th century remnant. If you want to talk about you know the past wrongs, we have a system that worked out okay, bringing people up, but uh, it's an assembly line system. For the most part, at 10 o'clock in a class you go into and you get math poured into your head and 11 o'clock you pour, get history poured in your head and so forth. That's not how children really learn. One of the members of my board, Michael Strong, runs private schools. Most of the kids in his schools, by the way, are minorities. And by the way, he's married to a woman from Senegal. Uh, so just as an interesting fact. But we have educational entrepreneurs in this country that I'd like to see unleashed. And the way you do that is you give parents the right to take the money that goes into their kids' education and pick what schools they go to. 70% of Swiss kids, by the way, go through an apprenticeship program. Uh, and a lot of them don't go on to four-year colleges because they learn a skill that can be finance, it can be technology, it can be all of these other uh, areas, not just plumbing, which we need more plumbers in this country. So again, an open free system, I think in the long term is going to solve the problems uh, in this country and in other countries, by the way, too, that, that we've discussed. All right, Dr. Hodgins, um, I... You keep mentioning universality, and the other time I said I, I was going to come to that um, with respect, especially to to the Enlightenment, as one of those um, pivotal moments in human history when this um, idea of universality was 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 promoted. Um, the question I want to ask you first, I'd like to pose it to Doctor um, Negedu, then bring it back to you. Dr. Zuberi, please hang on. I still have a question for you about learning science in mother tongues. But please, let's trash this um, enlightenment issue, especially as it relates to epistemic racism. So um, Dr. Negedu, please, I would like to um, get your comments on this and then um, cross it over to uh, Dr. Hodgins. Let's see if we can contrast uh, both your views on this views. matter. On this matter. Okay. All right, yeah, Okay. Uh, thank you. All right, Dr. Negedu. Uh, all right, Dr. Negedu. Uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, there's this book that was written by Emmanuel uh, Eze. Emmanuel Eze. It's a compilation yes. of works, actually, uh, which, which is tied to race and the Enlightenment, and yes. which he put together several writings, primary um, works of some of the Enlightenment philosophers uh, from yes. the Enlightenment era. And the, the basic and argument the basic that was made, argument that was made that book, was that race, race, as we understand it today, understand it today uh, which yeah. is uh, a biological taxonomy, taxonomy uh, tons, physical, tons, difference. physical difference. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are breaking. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so that race, as we understand, so understand it today, and racism also, and racism also, also as a system. Both of these have uh, their roots in the Enlightenment era, especially as some of the philosophers then were trying to reconcile the contradiction between notions of liberty and the, the, the upholding of slavery. All right? So, um, and that during that same era when um, liberalism was spreading, colonial domination was also spreading the extermination of native populations was also taking place across the Americas. And as such, um, some scholarship today would um, see that as part of the dark side of the enlightenment, which is rarely talked about. Um, we're discussing epistemic racism now, and 
Um, looking at the history of human knowledge, the Enlightenment era is one key moment we can't overlook. Uh, but what do you have to say about that notion that uh, both the notion, both, both the ideas of universality and liberty um, came hand in hand with the idea of race and racism from the Enlightenment era? The Enlightenment philosophers uh, and how some of them may have been guilty uh, in the construction of the idea of race and racism. Do you agree with that kind of scholarship? Kind of scholarship? Okay, yeah. Thanks for your question. Yeah, I'm. Uh, let me first of all uh, re echo the uh, a statement from uh, Ramon Grossfogel. Ramon Grossfogel is. Uh, a professor of sociology at the University of California. You know, uh, we, we met sometime uh, last year in 2019, and, and he said something uh, in his lectures. He said, uh, many of us from the global south, we read many of these Western philosophers with a lot of generosity that is not deserved. You know, we, we, we read many of these Western philosophers with a lot of generosity that is not deserved. And uh, we actually do not care to know the background of their thoughts. Now, I, the, the, the idea of, you know, universality or universalism, you know, and liberalism, you know, came hand in hand with race in a particular sense, I'm going to mention. Now, the philosophies of these enlightenment philosophers, when you go through their thoughts, you discover that we, we take their philosophies as well, universally established truths, universally established truths. Now, when, for instance, Rene Descartes, you know, came out with his thought, Cogito Ego Sum, you know, it, it looks appealing to everyone. But Descartes, for one, was talking about, you know, the, the Western individual seen from a God-eyed perspective, you know, that is supreme over every other. When many of these, when many of these works were written, Africa, for instance, and some parts of the global south were not considered as humans. They were considered as less than human. And that is why, for instance, in Germany, you could have, you know, during the, 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 the during the, during the era of the era of genocide, you find Adolf Hitler, for instance, uh, you know, when we talk of the killing of the Jews, the blacks, for instance, never had the problems of being killed because since they were not considered human, not talk less of being subhumans, they were kept in a zoo. Many of them were kept in a zoo. And you have some persons, you know, recounting their stories of being kept in zoos, you know, and other whites going to look at the blacks who are in the zoo because these were at the level of animals. So you, you, when, when we talk of universalism, the problem I have with universalism stems from the fact that uh, you, we, we talk about how the world should work when we give our ideal of how the world should work, we talk about universalism and we also see it in terms of globalization, but we also have a vision about how the world actually works in reality. When we look, about, when we look at how the world actually works in reality, it is a great divide from how it should work. So I think for me, what we talk about when we talk about universalism, globalization, is how the work should, should work in reality. Because within the context of universalism, I think we should be flawed when we have to do 
when we have to talk about methods of philosophizing or methods of doing our various disciplines. Now, Descartes, Immanuel Kant, David Hume, and the rest were writing from the Western perspective. And writing from that Western perspective, you know, they, they had their own cultural background, which does not align with us. Now, let me, you know, make it right here, straight to the point that these philosophers had their own relevant theories that are relevant to people, to even the colonized. However, their thoughts cannot be taken from the Western perspective and applied within you know, the African context without revision. And it is from this point of view, for instance, that we talk about the fact that, yeah, we cannot talk, speak totally of decolonization in its entirety. So we talk of moderate decolonization where we have, you know, relevant modernity and relevant tradition coming together. You know, you have, you know, uh, was it Kwame Apia who talked about, you know, uh, the contamination of cultures. So no, no, no nation is self-sufficient as we have it, but, you know, some nations for the uh, America, for instance, and many nations in Europe, are self-reliant, but no nation on the face of the earth is self-sufficient. So we can, I, I, I cannot talk of, you know, I cannot go in favor of absolute universalism because if I'm going to be dealing with problems from my continent, I should be able to look at it from the methods of my discipline from my culture. Okay. In the West, for instance, yes, hello. You still there? Yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Hello. Continue with, your continue with your thoughts. Yes, in, in the West, for instance, you know, I when. Can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, in the West, for instance, we, we talk about a bivalent method. You know, it, it was Casey Raju of India who proposed, you know, the logic of four alternatives, you know, for, for the Indians. And you, 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 you have people, for instance, in Africa, for instance, Jonathan Chima Konami in South Africa, talking about, you know, you know, a, a, a trivalent method, you know, for the African continent. So we must recognize in the world that there are multivalent alternatives. The transdisciplinarity, the transdisciplinary agora, which is being projected by your association, also acknowledges the fact that we have multivalent methods, which must be you know, respected. When you go through the charter of transdisciplinarity, you discover that you cannot talk of adequate transdisciplinarity without, you know, acknowledgement of multivalent alternatives in terms of solution to problems and answering questions. But at the same time, when we talk of these divergent methods, we also acknowledge the fact that one method could cut across another. So for instance, I could come to America and borrow some relevant ideas from there and apply it in my own society after undergoing revision within my culture. So that is not to say that I take, you know, American culture and trash it in its entirety without, you know, any relevant application to my culture. So, in, in terms of racism, there is an aspect of the history I think we, we do not talk about. When we talk about the enlightenment period, we also forget the fact that there were some Africans during that period, for instance, a man like Leo Africanus, you know, who lived in, I think in the year 1494 to 1554, long before Immanuel Kant, long before David Hume, who also projected the idea of the inferior inferiority of the African race. Now, this man in question was an African. He wasn't a European. So we cannot leave 
the likes of these people out who are Africans, who also projected these ideas long before these people in the Enlightenment period. You cannot leave them out. They are also as guilty as this, as Emmanuel Kant, as David Hume and the rest. Thank you. I have a question have for a you. Question for you. Yes. yes. Um, so you're um, rejecting so you're rejecting in every aspect, in every you, aspect you, that that science is science universal is universal and that African scientific knowledge is in fact is in Sorry, come again, I didn't get you. If you are rejecting, if you are rejecting can you mute your can mic? You mute your mic? Echo. If you're rejecting a uh, universality, are you also rejecting it in terms of science? Do you not think that science is universal and exact? And in fact, that African science or African scientific knowledge is inferior uh, to you know, um, uh, Caucasian and other, uh, other group scientific knowledge, which does not make, which does not make, go ahead. Thanks for your question. Now, uh, I, I, I made a comment. I said, I am not for absolute universalism. You know, I, I am not for absolute universalism. And I gave instances of borrowing from cultures because, you know, in our world, uh, no nation can be self-sufficient. So we, we talk about the contamination of cultures. You know, one culture influencing another in an intercultural uh, dialogue. So I am not for absolute universalism, which means, you know, I acknowledge the fact that science on its own, it's universal and it has universal application. But in some instances, when you take the universality of such application into another culture, all you have to do is revise in order to fit into the demands of such culture. Of course, we, you, you also know that we, we we can modernize without at the same time westernize, you know, as Huntington said. So science belongs to the era of modernity, not to the era of westernization. So I acknowledge solely that aspect of modernity, which is universal, applicable in all nations. But when you want to talk about how it works, for instance, in a particular community, how the results of a scientific discipline works for a particular community. When you bring it into such community, at some point, it needs revision in order to fit into the peculiarities of such society. Okay, uh, Dr. Negedu, um, I, I have to step in here um, because Dr. Zuberi just notified me that she will have to leave in a few minutes. Uh, actually, I'll pick up from where you left because I want to contrast, I want to see if we can have a contrasting view uh, from Dr. Hodgins on this issue of the enlightenment and race. Well, let's just give um, Dr. Zuberi some few minutes so that she can have a, I won't find out what before she leaves. So Dr. Zuberi, you're still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, and luckily okay. they're just talking about science and universalism and particularisms. And uh, the question I want to ask you, it's uh, related to that. Um, part of the work you do at Afro Science Foundation is um, the facilitation of the learning of science through use of mother tongues. Uh, I want to know, is there uh, something cognitively unique or some um, material advantage that Africans have to gain from learning science through use of mother tongues? Uh, okay, so I want to give you some background on that. Do you recall, um, okay, so Egypt, Egypt is Africa, right? So do you rem recall um, the building of pyramids? Mm. Scientific method is a Western construct. Uh, basically, when you look at it, I just wanted to let you know that I have a doctorate degree in pharmacy. So, and I, I, my, my undergrad degree is in chemistry. So when you talk about scientific method, what, what they are saying is uh, something is only proven when it uh, meets the criteria of scientific method. But 
they really ignore empirical data for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, we are, you know, just give you a very simple example. P human being evolved through millions of years and suddenly you are introducing genetic modified organism in our diet, in our daily life. And for the short period of time that you, um, you test on it and see if there's effects on human body. And for that short period of time, you say, well, it seems like it's fine. We tested for five years and everything seems okay. Then you just go with it and totally ignoring the empirical data. So I believe that African um, technology or the way of science in Africa is a lot more intuitive than that. I've always told people that I believe just by history alone, Africans is the oldest According to a mitochondrial study, we all came from a single African female. So they have the most time to develop their immune system and their, their biology. It is no surprise to me that intellectually speaking, Africans are, to me, outstanding and physically supreme, um, <clears throat> emotionally empathetic and spiritually integrated. So you're asking me if there's any advantage or unique points of studying science in African language. If a culture is its own language, and if you only can express who you are through, a, through your language, then if you're using another language, you may be losing a lot of who you really are. That's number one. Number two, I want to say that is, all roads lead to Rome. I'm not for against one modality or the other, but what I'm saying is don't hold. The, this whole systemic racism is all strategic. It come from um, language, it come from religions, it come from culture, it come from legislation. So to break it down, you need to break it down from there. You need to come, you need to use strategy. You cannot, when you go to, you know, I grew up like this too. I'm, I'm standing in line waiting for a restaurant to seat me. And then suddenly two white people came through and they got seated first, no matter how long I wait. I see this in Africa every single day. That got to stop. That is where systemic racism begins. It's the environment. You look around, you're being put as second class citizen in your own country that got to stop. I'm, I know I'm distracting a little bit, but because I have such short time, it's 802, so I gotta go. But these are my messages for you. And thank you so much for this opportunity. And you know, it was amazing to be able to meet you and I hope you will link up with me on LinkedIn so we can keep talking. Thank you again. Okay, we'll, we'll sure do that. And uh, thank you for being on the show. Thank Thanks you for your wonderful talk. insight share sure. with us. Bye. Okay, so, um, can we get back to Dr. Hodgins? Uh, because I wouldn't want us to lose the track of that argument over race and the enlightenment. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hodgins, uh, do you have uh, a different view uh, as um, contrary to that of um, Dr. Negedu on yes, this sir. notion that race, race was a construct of the enlightenment? Uh, yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> throughout human history, most of the world has been savage, brutal, uh, life has been, as Hobbes said, uh, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. Most people have lived in abject poverty. Uh, all societies had some form of slavery. Uh, most societies saw uh, other groups as inferior. Uh, there was a Roman thinker who I otherwise respect who said something like, the Britons uh, are too stupid even to be good slaves. Uh, this was a Roman view of, 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 the, Brit, of the British uh, back uh, during the Roman uh, uh, history. And of course, we've had periods of human history um, where we've had incredible achievements. If you look at uh, ancient China, it, you, can, you can indeed look at uh, Africa. I think it was uh, 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 metallurgy and smelting. One of the places that originated, I think, was in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken here. 
Um, you saw the pyramids built by the uh, by the Egyptians. You saw the arch in the Rome and the um, uh, 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 and roads built by Romans. So you've seen also periods of incredible uh, achievement in human history, but it all tended to fall down until the enlightenment, until this notion of universality that all humans are created equal or, or evolved equal or whatever words you want to, uh, to use there. Um, were there, uh, were there um, uh, a lot of people who were inconsistent? Absolutely, as there are uh, today, but the Enlightenment Revolution and those principles um, are what are important. Uh, I don't care in one sense about the history. Um, I mean, I do in the sense that I read a lot of these thinkers, but ultimately I don't care what culture anything comes from because I believe that truth is universal uh, in the sense that again, if you are a brain surgeon and operating on me, whether you come from Nigeria or China or a, a European country or South America, that doesn't matter to me. What matters is that you can operate on my brain and cure me of uh, if I have an ailment. That to me is what is important. Do you have to apply the principles to the particulars? Absolutely. We each live in particular communities. We each have to make our own way and find our own uh, 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 call, you know, our own, uh, what makes us comfortable and so forth. But ultimately, I don't care about what group you come from. And in fact, I think it's dangerous to have this collectivism, this almost neo-racism to say, well, we have to, we have to push and get away from colonial culture. Uh, you know, if something's coming from Africa or from an African and I think it's valid, wonderful. I, you know, I don't care. And it should be the same way all around. We have to transcend accidents of birth we can have our own particular communities and what makes us uh, 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 comfortable, but we have to reject tribalism ultimately and stop wasting time on fighting about, well, did, did, did Descartes really mean this or did he really mean that? It's an interesting academic argument. I could get in, I'm more of a, of a British empiricist, but who cares? I want to see Africa prosper. I want to see Americans in inner cities have opportunities uh, to realize what we'd like to call the American dream, but I think it's a universal dream. That's what I want to see. So I don't want to waste time on these things. I want to look at what works, what policies are best, what attitudes are best, and move ahead. So if, the, if that's what you're interested in, that's my enterprise with my organization is to do that. And um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, so much look at what worked. What you know, what things were like le uh, in the past, other than to get past all the bad stuff, like in South Africa and, and you know, the racism that we've had in this uh, country. So unfortunately, for so many. Uh, Idara, you have a, a response for Dr. Hodgins? Yes, um, definitely agree with your your perspective, uh, Dr. Hodgins. But um, someone from the audience had a question for you, and they wanted to know. What, what are your thoughts on systemic racism? And another person did want to, did ask you, uh, Brenda Ramo Kapoa, how, how does one get past, um, you know, systemic racism? How do we change it? Okay, yeah, Brenda is great, by the way. She's in South Africa. Hi, Brenda, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the answer is, again, I, 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 earlier I discussed systemic racism and I think it, 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 you have to look at the difference between actual legal racism, which should always be knocked down, and they did it in South Africa, they did it in the United States and elsewhere. Um, what I would say is racist attitudes, where even if you don't have legal racism, there are still people, I'm sad to say, in South Africa and other places who might look upon Blacks and say, well, okay, maybe we shouldn't treat them differently legally, but they're still inferior. Fortunately, in the United States, again, because I've got decades of experience, I've seen that kind of racism reduced. I remember as a student talking to actual racists in this country who said, yes, well, but blacks, you've got to admit they're, they're not as smart as us and so forth. And I said, yeah, well, they're, they're, it, they, they might not perform because we've got terrible schools and so forth. So you have to reject that, but then you have to look at the institutions. And there you have problems, not so much institutional racism, but what I would call the uh, soft bigotry of low expectations, 
of treating people as if, well, blacks can't live up to those standards. So we have to have a different set of standards. And so I, that's, that's, that would be my answer. I'm not, I don't think that we're fundamentally a racist society in the United States. I mean, we did elect a black president. We have a black vice president right now. Uh, we have a black Supreme Court justice. And I could go over all the people I work with who are black, who you know, do perfectly well. To Brenda's question, I think in a sense, I've tried to answer it by saying that we have to reject the racist attitudes of the past, but we have to start looking ahead. We have to look at how we open opportunities for people. Uh, you know, I know that when my grandparents came to this country from Italy, they were called WAPs uh, and they were looked upon as dirty and so forth. But fortunately they had opportunities to get ahead. I know that my, uh, my wife's family, well, she doesn't have a big family because most of them were, uh, were murdered in the Holocaust. And they managed to get here as you know impoverished Eastern Europeans and they were able to use the system to, to move up. So I think it's opportunity, opportunity that we really should focus on. And then where you don't see an opportunity because of a systemic problem or whatever, then you deal with it. Um, and that's a, there's a lot of aspects to that issue and I'm happy to talk to anybody offline about it. Well, um, um, very insightful and um, there's a lot to, to chew upon there, but we're running out of time. And um, I think we still have to uh, give one or two words to Mr. Chongwi and um, Ernesto who have been patiently waiting by the side. So uh, at this point, I would like to bring in Mr. Chongwi uh, and it's still something to do with this notion of universalism um, versus particularism or do we see universalism and particularism coexisting side by side? Uh, Mr. Chongwe, you are, again, uh, an African in the diaspora, a Cameroonian in France. And I think you've, you've also, in your thesis, I think, you wrote something about um, Afro descendants in France. Uh, so I, I gather you, you, you're concerned with the experiences of the, uh, Afro descendants or people of African descent. Um, in Europe and across the world. Now, we've been talking about universalism, but also the need to preserve our particularity. So the question I'd like to pose to you is, um, how uh, or, 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 or what, first, what is the African personality? And then how do we go about preserving um, the African personality among Afro descendants, uh, both in Europe, in the Americas, and wherever they find themselves in the world. You can start this from your own personal experience and then um, just generalize. Uh, I will just say something about universalism. Uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think humanity is made for universalism. I think universalism is a word uh, that just want to uh, bring people together, but in, in a ways that some of want us to be. I will explain what I'm, what I'm saying. You, you, you need to have a strong community, but community is built by the same, the people that came from the same, uh, the, the same area. You, if you look out at the issue of humanity, there is always a differences. Human has always made a differences between, between them. Uh, there is always a difference between the people that come from the south, the people that come from the north, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think this universality is is a big word for no. It's a it's a word that just don't uh, don't don't uh, exist as we think uh, <clears throat> because. You, we need to make a strong community. As I saw that when I was doing politics in, politics in France, to have a black man representative, he needs his own community to endorse him and to bring him to the responsibilities. And uh, that's, that's, how you make a, that's how you make a strong, uh, you, you bring a strong, uh, you, 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 you make your community strong by bringing them together and then we can coexist together. But I think universality will never ever exist because we, human, human always made a difference between us. So that's my point of view. And then uh, to uh, keep 
our uh, how how specificity African specificity. I think we we for for me I come from Cameroon and uh, I know a lot of uh, some people doesn't talk uh, their languages their native languages and I think it's very very important to teach to every African uh, the, the 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 languages from their from their country from their from their region for them from them cities that we bring us closer to to uh, to others from their communities so uh, so i think that's the, the learn the languages learn the, the 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 culture the entire culture uh, we need to have more people that write about our com our our culture because you know uh, african history is more talk than write and we need some people that we write about that, uh, about what we, or, or not not only the the prism of the 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 view, sorry, of the of the 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 sorry if, if I say that, but you know the history is white by the winners, but we need to have uh, to to look back of what our story, uh, what our, uh, our story was about, and then we can have an identity. Of what, uh, of where we came from, and who we are, uh, and then teach us to our children. I think education is the basis. Education is the most important thing because you you learn to our children to okay, we are in a world that have some more specificity, but you have to keep your own tradition. You have to know your your worth as a person because you know uh, we 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 when when I was in, when I was young. Uh, I was learning uh, slavery and all that. I think that uh, that is that is important to to of course to uh, to share with the student. But we need also to have a, an important part about African uh, African. Uh, how can I say king of Af king, king from Africa that lived uh, before slavery? I think we need to have all of that points and also say okay, oh there is slavery, but oh. You can also rely to the kings and then the queens that come from your from your area, and then I think it's very very important because I see that when I'm in France, you know, the people that come, I, I, you know, history uh, after the after during the war, the thirty nine to forty five, uh, African people come to help the France to to battle against the German, and now they stay in. The people that that uh, birth after the the war are like they don't know where they are come from, and I think it's very very important that uh, if you want to talk about universality, as we talk now, the the government has to to also share the story to that person, to take them in count. Like okay, you are now part in France, but you have a story uh, that I want to tell you. I want to uh, also tell you. That's why I said that universality doesn't exist. For now, because people, okay. because I just finished like one minute, because we are in a system that, you know, when I look the, the Western system, they don't, uh, they don't teach us where, uh, how, what were our, our story. So that's my view. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I've just been notified that we have uh, less than eight minutes to to wrap this up. So um, I would like to give. Um, space for one last word to Mr. Yeboah, then we'll come back and take um, final comments from each of the panelists. And then my co-hosts will give a closing remark and then uh, we'll, we'll call it a wrap. So Mr. Yeboah, uh, much of what we've discussed uh, during this session has been on epistemic and institutional racism. Um, you are an activist. So uh, tell us, um, is it that we need more activism in the academia um, to um, achieve this, this cause for justice and equal opportunities uh, within the space of education that um, this conversation has tried to, uh, to, to bring to the fore? Uh, as an activist, can you tell us um, if it's activism that is needed more in the academia, and then how do we go about this? Well, thank you very much, um, 
once again. Um, Chago, I think um, you read rightly that um, I am not an academic, even though I have um, two master's degrees, one in communication and um, another in um, history. But um, I'm just not an academic. Um, what I'm good at is in activism, in advocacy, and um, activism and advocacy um, brings to the fore the need to understand um, people and not just what they are saying, but um, what could be the conditions surrounding um, them, uh, allowing them to say or to feel the way um, they feel. I've listened to um, my brother, um, Frederick um, Hudgens very, very keenly. And um, I find his idea on um, universality uh, very fascinating. Um, but then I also look at it from the point of view of um, who is a victim of history and who is the beneficiary. Um, along the way, when he was um, making his submission, he raised the book and um, more or less recommended it. Um, if I did the same by lifting a book in written in my language, I can and showed it to, to him and to all of us, I mean, as audience, I'm sure um, it would not be long for him to understand that one, he's ignorant, and two, he um, needs education. So on this specific issue of, of, of um, uh, epistemic um, racism, we are looking at a particular issue that, 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 that confronts the people of, 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 of the world. And like I have already said, I, I mentioned um, the issue of, of, of language. And then when you enter the field of academia itself, um, take African history, for instance, and many of the authorities um, one has to cite in the um, recount of African history are uh, ones by white folks uh, on what their perspectives are on the African people that they met. And even where we start in terms of our history, and um, you would realize that it's African history has almost become synonymous to the history of slavery. But who said that before slavery, we did not have a life? Look at, I mean, Rhodes entering into a space, naming that space, regardless of the, 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 the people that existed and occupied that particular land. So when one talks about universality, the foremost question that comes to mind is who is the beneficiary? Of course, if Hudgens um, enters um, a space, I mean, a common space in Africa, he is much more likely to be treated preferentially by our own black people than, um, than, 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 than the reception that may be accorded us. But then when I listen to him on the breaking down of um, the, the, the statutes of roads and uh, I mean, colonialism and all of that. His point is that it amounts to tokenism, it's a symbolism over substance. But that's not it. I mean, what he calls symbolism is a substance that is lived by a certain body of people, the discrimination that they face, the oppression that they face, the um, uh, denial in opportunities that they face. So you cannot reduce this to symbolism. 
it is the life that is lived and experienced by a body of people, which academia, I mean, as we, 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 we are discussing right now, finds a problem that needs to be addressed. And so to dismiss it by um, jumping onto um, very idealistic theories of universality, there, there cannot be, I mean, that's, 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 that concept really. And, 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 and I want to say that it, it cannot be grounded fully in, 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 in academia. Yes, one plus one in Africa is two. And it is two in Europe and in any part of the world. Yes, those are things that we can, we can, we can agree on. But beyond that are specificities that needs addressing that cannot be washed away by, by uh, idealist um, aspirations to, 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 to a universal whole. So that's, for me, is one thing that needs to be. When Isaiah was um, making his um, submission, he talked about the fact that um, there's a double standard in, in, in the originators of the Roads Must Fall campaign, uh, uh, given that they obtained Roads Scholarship. I don't see the double standard here. What I see is a matter of a difference in perspective. And what am I talking about? I'm simply referring to the fact that here is a body of people who feel that one group of people some time back in our history came regardless of the people, dissipated their wealth, stole their resources, raped their women, inflicted pain, which from that historical, how do you call it, perspective or, 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 or point has had some consequences leading to the denial in certain privileges that, that, that may be existing today, which is why um, the Rhodes Foundation may itself feel the guilt of wanting to, 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 to do the damage control of, 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 of providing a scholarship scheme that can enable those who must have suffered or those who may have been victims of that violation to, to, to um, one way or the other recoup themselves. So when one looks at it from that perspective, you cannot say that um, there's, there's, it amounts to double standards. So these for me are some of the, 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 the issues that needs to be brought to the fore. We need to understand each other from um, our various perspectives and also from the background of our history that has uh, detected where we, we stand today. Um, Hudgens, for instance, talks about Obama being uh, elected as uh, uh, yes, a black president of America and all of that. But the question has also been that what did Obama do for black people? In fact, Obama bombed the most prosperous and only shining example of, of, of a black nation, which is Libya. So when, when, when we have these conversations, it has to be situated in the right context. After all, after Obama was Trump, a, a, a racial, I mean, bigot who, who, who believes in the superiority of the white man. So what did it really resolve? Nothing. What did Obama's presidency resolve? Nothing. So we, 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 oh, all right. these are Ernesto. the conversations that, 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 that Ernesto, um, we, we, we have to go. We have I to go, understand. but those are very powerful and provocative comments you, you, you're making. And I say we have much food for thought, much food for thought in um, these remarks you just made. Perhaps another conversation uh, for another day could be, um, be initiated 
have to take off from this. Absolutely. Yeah, so this, like I say, very provocative statements you're making. But at this point, we'll have to go and um, we'll just give 30 seconds to each of our panelists uh, to give their concluding comments. And then um, I will bring, uh, we'll, we'll bring back my co-hosts um, to give her our own concluding remarks too and vote of thanks before we wrap. So let's start with Dr. Negedu. Please, just your 30 just seconds, your 30 seconds um, to wrap up, um, to, wrap your, up your, 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 to give your submission. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think for me, in, in all of this, there are certain things we need to do. One, I think we should have a level, some level of constructive modernization where we see that there is a meeting point of cultures and not a situation where one culture is a master and others are students. History also should be taught by people who truly know history. And I think that also that when we venerate the past, we should have a sense as people from the global south of an intentional future. And lastly, we should be wary of race identifiers. That is those blacks, especially within Africa, who act as whites in order that through that they may enjoy the benefits from white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lebedu. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hodgins. Dr. Hodgins. Oh. I'll, I'll just... Uh... I'll just uh... I'll just end with, just end with this. this. Yeah. Uh, the education system, the, education the, higher, system, education the higher education system, system in the United States, in, United States, in many ways, in many is very ways corrupt is as well corrupt because of postmodernism, because, 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 because of the rejection of the principles, of the principles that have led to the prosperity in the United States here. I'll mention another thing. I, uh, when I was at the Heritage Foundation, I came up with the idea of an index of economic freedom uh, and Africa was part of my focus. I can show you the data that indicates that if, if Africans in their own countries, to say nothing in the United States, want to prosper uh, and not have the kind of abject poverty you see in Nigeria and, this, and other countries, you have to look at economic freedom and economic opportunities. The final thing I'll mention is this. When I talk about universality, I mean that stop thinking of ourselves just as members of a tribe, whether it's Italian, whether it's European, whether it's African, those are particularities that we have and those are wonderful, but accidents of birth do not define us morally. What defines us morally is the creation of our own moral character and our achievements, whether you're nurturing a child to maturity or business to profitability or writing a song or a poem or a business plan or a dissertation or laying the bricks to the building or financing it or designing it. That's what I mean by universality. And that's what I mean about personal identity. Oh, all right, thank you. Excellent, uh, Mr. Session. Frederick. Excellent session. Uh, Mr. Frederick, just um, five seconds, five, 10 seconds, please. Mr. Frederick. All right, uh, Ernesto, Ernesto, just your five, Seconds of closing remark. We'll come back. Sorry, to sorry, I'm sorry, I have a problem. I just, I just want to say quick, very quickly, right. uh, that that I think universality uh, will never ever exist. What is very, very important is coexist. We can coexist together, but universality will be difficult. And I think every community should come, should should, should talk uh, with each other and then make a point that okay, we want to work in different top in different. We want we can work together to improve to have a better world and uh, and that's my 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 talk today. All right, uh, Comrade Ernesto, uh, five seconds, please. Ernesto, hello, hello, Ernesto. Yes. Yes, yes, I please. can hear you. Just a few seconds. Just wrap up, please. Yes. My last words are that epistemic um, racism is an issue, and we must accept that it is an issue that needs to be addressed. We cannot flatten it by hanging on to fallacious theories of universality when there are actually differences that needs addressing. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, Idara, please, can you uh, give our panelists some closing remarks and then bring our session to you? Yes, table? this has been quite an insightful um, uh, conversation on, you know, 
a broad range of um, perspectives. I quite agree that um, universalism does exist in the context that Mr. Hudgens is um, describing it and um, the conversation and the perspective of um, Eileen Zuberi was also very insightful. Um, I do believe that uh, moving forward is essential and not to continue bringing up, uh, you know, ish situations that occurred in the past. Um, and our perspectives are unique. Um, the idea of, um, you know, the, the very use of the term colonialism is interesting to me because that, that's, that's not a word I would use um, to describe the sharing of knowledge between races. I mean, how, how it came to be. Maybe that was in the past, but at this time when slavery is not an issue, um, the knowledge that we, we have among different groups is something that everyone should benefit from. Um, but overall, it's, it's been a very interesting conversation that that will inform my perspective going forward. All right. I agree that this has been a very interesting conversation and uh, I hope we'll keep it going. Um, if any of you would like to have the contact of a fellow panelist, just reach out to me and I will be glad to share such contact with you so that um, we can continue the discussions elsewhere. Um, thank you all for being on uh, the panel this, thank this you very evening. Uh, thank you all very thank much. You. It's been an honor having you. Having you. Having you. Oh, thank, thank you. Excellent yes, panel. I wish you all a lovely weekend. All, weekend. all right, you too. Right. See right. you next time in town hall. See you next time in town hall. Right. Bye bye.